Our friend Larry Swedro from Buckingham Strategic Wealth has just published his 16th book, Your Complete Guide to a Successful and Secure Retirement. Larry joins us today on Your Money, Your Wealth to talk about this definitive retirement resource, the two biggest retirement mistakes, and what Larry calls the five horsemen of the retirement apocalypse. Plus, is there a way to consolidate your investment portfolio before you retire and avoid paying capital gains tax? But first, dancing to stave off dementia, the world of golf, and China and Brexit news. But probably not the kind you're expecting. I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson, CFP, and Big Al Clopine, CPA. You know, we have a lot of stuff going on here in the United States. Tariffs, volatile stock market. New tax return. That's yeah. The postcard. The postcard. That's yep. the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> uh, but China. Did you hear about what's going on and over in China, Alan? Yeah. They uh, apparently they they they've got a new app that you can put on your phone to to find people that are in debt and in in debt in a big way. Have you ever heard of such a thing? No. Neither have I. So but it a, hopes right because there, there's these bad debtors. Yeah. So they they want. People to be to point them out, whistleblowers. Hey, there's a there's a deadbeat debtor. In yeah, my, in, this guy owe, owes so much money, but yeah. you know, look at him. He's he's in Bloomingdale's. Yeah, is yeah, there yeah. Bloomingdale's in China? Uh, I, don't I, know. I doubt it. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I guess they've already implemented this, and uh, so people have been reporting others and and about, more than six thousand people. They've been punished already because of this because they failed to pay their taxes or they misbehaved on public transportation. They were barred from what taking planes, trains, and, and out of the country between June and January. What yeah, the hell? I mean, what is misbehaving? I wonder on uh, public transportation. I, I don't know. Hmm. Interesting. So anyway, so that's uh, I guess you could we could have that here. That would be a lot of fun, <laughs> right? I, 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 my phone would be going bananas <laughs> around Big Al. <laughs> you would keep reporting me. Yes. They would say. They would say the big debt on Big Al. They would say, "Oh, you know what? Something there's a glitch in our problem." It was actually Joe Anderson. Yeah. It's actually the person sending. This. Yes. So it's actually part of China's social credit system. Yeah, social yeah. credit. It's pretty creepy. Yeah, it is. It's, it is a bit creepy. Hey, you know what? There's also something that we need to implement here at Pure Financial Advisors. <laughs> we call it the anger room. Yeah. Yeah. So they call it smash there in Beijing. Right. Uh, for about twenty three dollars American, that's one hundred fifty eight. One. Did yeah. you know that? Yeah. See how my see, see how pretty, good I am it's, with. It's um, pretty good, with, especially when it's right in front of you. <laughs> with, with, that I could uh, the, the make that tra- exchange that rate translation just yeah. really quickly. Yeah. Um, they will let you spend a half an hour destroying household objects like wine bottles, TVs, computers, and furniture with hammers and bats while wearing protective gear and listening to your music of choice. I think they'd have to charge you double. You would just go through everything they had. Smash opened in September to help people deal with the pressures of living in the big city. Or maybe the pressures of having social credit. Yeah, bad social credit. Uh, and then there's also something going on in the European Union. So we're nine weeks away for what? Bre- Brexit. Correct. And the and, Brits. Uh, and by the way, just that's that's Britain leaving the European Union. Thank you. In terms of trading. Got it. So what what they've done over there is you know these Brits are, are worried they might need a little survival kit. So yeah, they got because, the, the Brexit box. Right, because they're worried they may not be, get the imports from Others. other other European countries. Right. Including so, some of the food and things that they like. Uh, retailing at 295 pounds. Yeah. I mean, wait, wait, that's Let's probably going to be about $380. <laughs> you know, you're right on, according to this paper in front of us. <laughs> uh, provides food rations to last 30 days. 30 okay. days. All right. So, so when you're looking at, what do you think is in this thing? So you, you pay a few hundred bucks. So they got medical supplies, got some food. Yep. You know, um, and then they have their favorite foods. What do you think some of the favorite foods are? Well, I'm going to say chicken, <laughs> <laughs> chili con carne, <laughs> macaroni and cheese. I love macaroni and cheese. Have you ever, you've been to uh, uh, Britain, London? Have you ever yeah, been over there? Sure, yeah, a couple times. Did uh, you Did you enjoy the food? No. That's one thing about Britain is that their food is not the best. It's I, I, <laughs> I, I like the beer. I like the atmosphere. I like the town. I love, like the vibe. Love. 
but, but, but the, yeah, the you, food. you need to bring in your own food. Yeah, <laughs> the taters and mash and whatever that was. Bangers and mash. Bangers and mash. You ever had that, Andy? I ba- have. Bangers. Yeah. And, you, do you like it? No. no. <laughs> yeah, same problem. I like the meat pies. I like the, yeah, the, the shepherd's shepherd pies. pies. Yeah, yeah, those, yeah. yeah, actually, I agree. Those were okay. Yeah, yep. I like macaroni and cheese, but... But I, I did get a banger and meat, or banger and... Bangers and mash. Mash, thank you. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was a little disappointing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you can get this uh, this Brexit box, and you can then survive for the next 30 days. 30 days. And the reason why they have to have the box is no one likes British food, so they have to get... <laughs> they're afraid they're not going to get their imported for the chicken. So they're going to be surpri- sur- surviving with uh, freeze-dried fajitas. Yeah. So you don't think that there's chicken in Britain? <laughs> chicken tikka. What is chicken actually, tikka? It's uh, Indian food, which is incredibly popular in, in Britain. Well, and uh, they probably don't have chicken fajitas. Yes. And that's part of uh, the kit, apparently. Oh. And, you also and it also has mince, which mince. is meat. In, in American, that's ground beef. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And you emergency water filter. Because mm-hmm. maybe the water systems will shut down. And fire lighter liquid. Um, last but not least here. <laughs> this is for you. Yeah. I'm going to buy these shoes. <laughs> Nike just <laughs> unveiled uh, the new version of the Air Mac 1 golf sneakers. Yeah. Uh, they look, if you wear them and you're in, in grass, you can't even see your feet. <laughs> Why? What is the purpose of that? They, they look like grass. They're grass shoes. Yeah, they look like grass. They're yeah. AstroTurf, I guess. So, yeah. so you can blend in with your surroundings. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't it just look like you don't have feet? Wouldn't, that'd be cool. <laughs> All these golfers with no feet. <laughs> that's, that's the that's the purpose. That, it gets you really I focused that's, on your game. That's <laughs> that's something they had to do it on Halloween, just on a normal round. Here's one last thing. A study was done by the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, Alan. Right. Since you'd like to quote Albert Einstein. I do have a propensity towards that. Uh, It's in New York City in 2003 to determine if any physical or cognitive recreational activities influence mental acuity. Acuity. (laughs) Okay, the microphone got in the way. I thought it was activity. (laughs) Acuity. All right. The results were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm not sure where we're going with this, but it's going to be good. I'm sure. They found that dancing was the only physical activity that reduces the risk of dementia. Really? Bicycling, swimming, playing playing golf golf offered no protection whatsoever. Now, you should be fine because you're a great dancer. I am a very good dancer. But you probably never do it. What? Dance? I dance. I mean, you probably dance once I dance probably, no. You don't dance as often as you golf, though. I dance probably three times a week. You do? Absolutely. Where? In my bedroom. (laughs) (laughs) In my living room. Frequent dancing yeah. offers yeah. a seventy percent. I put a Darth percent. Vader mask on. <laughs> well, I know you do. And that. I and I start dancing in my living room. Reduces the risk of dementia by seventy six. Seventy six. I was getting there. Frequent dancing offers a seventy six percent reduction of dementia and increases cognitive acuity to all ages. Hmm. So for okay. cognitive activities, doing crossword puzzles at least four days a week reduces dementia by the risk of forty seven percent, reducing. Uh, reading reading <laughs> reduces dementia risk by 35%. Apparently, there you go. I dancing. need to do more crossword puzzles and read, but um, it's not, dancing. Not as good as dancing, dancing. apparently. Yeah. Um, yeah, I enjoy dancing. Yeah. Quite you're, often. You're pretty I don't good go to the clubs yeah. and dance. You know, I will dance at my house. Yeah, put, I've, I've seen you dance at put, your house. Put a little music on. Right. You can do a little this, a right. little that. You know, it's a good time. Yeah, usually what happens is we're all dancing, and then you're so entertaining, we stop yeah, just, and watch. Yeah, just throw, watch. Throw dollars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it happens. It a- absolutely does I don't happen. think I've ever thrown a dollar at oh. you. At you <laughs> yeah, it's been tens and twenties. <laughs> That's hundreds. <laughs> yes. What are you talking about? Find links to all of the articles mentioned in the show notes for today's episode at the brand new yourmoneyyourwealth.com. If you're looking for a way to keep the body and mind active in retirement, sounds like dancing like Joe does is the way to go. Maybe your retirement side hustle would work for you as well. Check out the Your Money, Your Wealth TV show on retiring in the gig economy, also in the show notes. Speaking of your life in retirement, Larry Swedro is the director of research for Buckingham Strategic Wealth, and he's written 15 different books on various aspects of investing. He's just published his 16th book, Your Complete Guide to a Secure and Successful Retirement, which goes into all aspects of retirement. Larry's been on the shelf many, many times for the last several years. Larry, how many years have you been joining us on this awful program? 
Uh, I don't know, but it does seem like forever. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like forever for you, Larry. Yeah, he, he gets the call. Okay. He gets the call from us. He's like, "Oh, those not, not, not those, again." Not again. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to come on and uh, hopefully be helpful. Every time Larry's on the show, too, he's like, "Well, now this what this is my last book." Right. This is my last book. We have heard that, Larry, for probably about eight years. <laughs> uh, I have to admit that's true. I, I actually. <laughs> had uh, the idea for your complete guide to a successful and secure retirement for about 10 years, having written a guide to the accumulation phase, and also the only guide uh, to the right financial plan, the only guide to alternative investments, and the only guide to a winning bond strategy. So what was missing was how do you deal with the rest of your life once you retire and go into withdrawal phase so I tackled the book, and in two months, uh, with the help of an all-star team I recruited to help write the various chapters that they're experts on, uh, we finished the book. And I'm real proud. I think it is the most comprehensive book on retirement out there. I would agree. Um, I have have read my fair share of financial planning books, and um, you know, the, the organization of it, and just kind of walks you through uh, basically what everything that you need to do to have a successful retirement. Uh, let me ask you this, Larry, because you've written so many books, a lot of them on v investing, you know, what is the smart way to do it in, you know, helping people to become such a better investor. But, you know, investing in a successful retirement is just a small piece of it. Uh, did you get bored with like other areas of the book and saying, I really don't re want to do it? I mean, was there a challenge of like diving into the other areas or you, you said you had experts? Tell me a little bit about how you organized everything. Well, the first chapter of the book um, is uh, all about planning a meaningful life in retirement. It has nothing to do with the money and financial issues. Uh, and I think that's absolutely critical. We, many of us do have financial plans, but we forget about planning a meaningful life. And the sad part is having done the research, having read some books on the subject and recruited one of the authors of what I think is the best book uh, on the subject, Your Retirement Quest. I had learned how important it was that to plan a meaningful life, there's that old saying, those who plan to fail, fail to plan. And the problem is that most of us get much of our uh, joy out of life from work. It's the social connections we have and the intellectual stimulation, the sense of accomplishment, all of those things. And when you retire, those things are no longer there. So if you don't plan to have a meaningful life, uh, it can create serious problems. We touch on the book. Uh, some of them, I'll just mention some key statistics. The highest suicide rate in the U.S., I would have guessed, was teenage girls, and it is now retired men. Uh, the second thing is the fastest growing rate of divorce is the, co uh, the cohort where it's the highest is what is now called silver divorces. Honey, I married you for better or worse, but not for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so many people understand preparing for retirement is that, all right, I need a certain dollar figure in my retirement account or my brokerage account and Social Security and everything else. But they, there's such a lack of planning of what they're going to do, how they're going to spend their time, what their relationships are going to look like, what is their purpose in life. And, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm going to play golf every day. And then a couple months later, they're like, I'm never playing golf again. Yeah, because it becomes work. It's not a joy. It's not the exception. It's fine probably to play once or twice, maybe even three times a week. But uh, because it does get you out and have social connections, but you also need mental stimulation and a sense of contributing. It might be through charitable work. Uh, it could be through things. I have friends who have become big brothers. I have two uncles who started preparing taxes for the elderly and doing it either free or cheap or you know ver at very low cost. I've had a friend who became a candy striper in a hospital. Others who go on to take classes at university to keep learning. Uh, whatever is good for you and creates meaning uh, 
in your life and gives you what I call a reason to get up in the morning, that's what you need to plan for, practice it. That's what I learned uh, from Alan Spector. You need to imagine what that perfect day in retirement looks like. And uh, maybe while you're on vacation, you know, practice that day and see if that really works for you. Yeah. You know, you kind of paint a, a little bit of a gloomy picture in the beginning of the book um, of like almost the retirement apocalypse of the four horsemen of, of, of what's coming down the pike. Uh, share with th- th- that analogy. Yeah, the, there is a problem for investors who are approaching retirement. Uh, uh, and I would say even worse for the younger generation. Uh, the people who are right now having just retired or very close to it have benefited from basically a 36 year run uh, of bull markets in both stocks and bonds. Uh, over the longest period we have data for, from 1927 through 2018, the 60-40 portfolio had returned uh, about 8.5 percent. Uh, but over the 36-year period, it was about 2 percent higher. Uh, and the problem is we got that great returns. The end result of it was that U.S. valuations, the P.E. ratios are today much higher than they have been historically. And of course, bond yields have collapsed. Uh, So while stock returns in the U.S. have been about 10 percent, most financial economists today think because of higher valuations, they're likely to be more in the neighborhood of six or seven. And obviously, you can't get five or six percent from safe bonds any longer when the 10 year Treasury is yielding about 2.7 percent. So we think and most financial economists agree a 60 40 portfolio is likely to provide a real return of not about seven percent plus that three percent inflation we'd experience, which would have been 10, but more like. Uh, 3% real and 2% inflation, roughly. So that's five. So problem number one is we have much higher valuations for stocks, much lower bond yields. That means you should expect much lower returns, which means you need to save more and or work longer. Third problem, which is a good one to have, we are tending to live much longer. So you need a bigger pot of money because you need it to last longer. And third problem is a result of the I'm sorry, the fourth problem is a result of that third increased longevity. As we age, the increased risk of very expensive long term care increases dramatically, including the risk of cognitive decline uh, in high cost areas that could easily be 100, 150,000 a year. And I know you folks live in a high cost area. So we need to plan for those things. Those are the four horsemen. I added a fifth, which is the fact that Social Security, if it isn't addressed quickly, is going to be short of its ability to meet its obligations. It's not going bankrupt. People should not be scared of that. But if there's no changes in 13 more years, Social Security will only be able to pay out 75% of promised benefits. So people need to be realistic, take these facts into account, do not rely on historic returns. That's a big mistake that even professionals make. And you need to develop a plan that incorporates the reality of today's world and greater longevity. You can find the transcript of this interview and the link to purchase Larry's book, Your Complete Guide to a Successful and Secure Retirement, in the show notes for today's episode at the brand new yourmoneyyourwealth.com. And be sure you're subscribed to the Your Money, Your Wealth podcast, because next week, millennial millionaire Grant Sabatier joins us. You may remember he was on the podcast last year. He's the guy that went from having $2.26 to a million bucks in just five years. He'll tell us about reaching financial freedom with a proven path to all the money you will ever need. Now, more with Buckingham Strategic Wealth Director of Research and author of Your Complete Guide to a Successful and Secure Retirement, Larry Swedro. You know, there's all sorts of different strategies, I think, 
uh, when it comes to retirement type planning. Uh, the, you know, accumulation planning is one thing. It's like, okay, we'll save as much money as possible. Um, but then when you turn the corner and now you are retired, you need to create income from the portfolio that you have accumulated. And I know that there's, you know, the bucket approach in that you just wrote about. You know, there's the total return approach. There's Monte Carlo simulations. There's all sorts of different things, you know, or high dividend paying stocks. I think that's your favorite, Larry. Um, you know, MLPs. I mean, there's all sorts of, I think, buzzwords and different investment um, alternatives or strategies that people could to, to use to, to create income. What should people be thinking about as they turn the corner, as they approach retirement, as they need to start drawing dollars from their portfolio? Well, it's, a, it's obviously a huge topic. We could spend hours on it alone. I'll try to be succinct here and touch on a, two key issues. First is a big mistake I find that people make is they often want to uh, take a income uh, approach instead of a total return approach. So they need income from their portfolio. They don't want to tap into the principal which makes no sense because you don't live forever and you can't take the money with you. Uh, and an income approach in an environment like we had for the last 10 years where safe bonds got you virtually nothing caused many people to sell those safe bonds, buy uh, high dividend paying stocks, MLPs, REITs, things like that, and all you need is a repeat of 2008, and you could see 30, 40, 50 percent of that money disappear overnight. And that's a disaster when you're in retirement, because now you're withdrawing funds from your portfolio. And if the market eventually recovers, you can't recover because that's money has been spent. That creates what's called sequence risk. Uh, and the order of returns matters greatly. So one thing I would advise against is taking an income-based approach. You should take a total return approach, which will prevent you from making the mistake of chasing yields. That's probably the biggest mistake right there is dealing with that. And the other mistake I would say is the fact that when you retire at 65, the second to die life expectancy of a typical couple is 25 years, which means half the time one of you is going to be living longer, which means you still have to plan for 30 years. And that means you can't get too conservative or inflation could become a serious problem. So you have to plan for a very long lifetime uh, much longer than our parents had to plan for. When I was growing up, I hardly knew anyone who was over 75. Right. And, you know, it's hard, too, when you look at, um, you know, us talking about long term. If someone's in their 60s and saying, all right, well, what's the, I need the money tomorrow, Larry. I need the money tomorrow. And, you know, I have to live off of this. And then the volatility of the markets, I think people look at their portfolios a lot more than they probably should. And then they make the dreaded mistake of either selling out or going into a lot more conservative type portfolio that's a lot less volatile, per se. But it's not going to give them the yield or the return that they need to last 30 years because they, they, they don't have that time frame in their head. They're thinking, well, I need my time frames, you know, this month, I need to pay my bills. So yeah. it, it, it gets a little challenging. Well, there's no question we have all kinds of behavioral problems uh, and you do need to become generally more conservative when you're in retirement because you no longer have uh, your labor capital, which can replace uh, losses in the market. Uh, if that labor capital can allow you to uh, live off of that income without having to spend money from your portfolio that can't be recovered if and when the market recovers. But as we touched on, you have to find a balance because you still need to plan for a very long horizon at age 65. So there used to be a rule of thumb uh, that you shouldn't take out more than 4% of your portfolio the day you retire, and then you can adjust that for inflation. So if you had a million dollars, 
you should only take out 40,000 the first year. If you have 5% inflation, you could take out 42,000 the next year. And if you did that, the odds of you running out of money would be very low as long as you maintained a moderate equity allocation in the area of 40, 50% of stocks. But because of the issues we touched on in the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, the new 4%, we believe, is 3%. So today, to be safe, you need to keep a reasonable equity allocation and not withdraw more than 3% of your portfolio. And that's why it's so important to plan for this before you retire may mean you need to work longer, you need to lower your goal in retirement, you may need to move to a lower cost of living area, downsize, uh, all kinds of uh, alternatives are there which are better than taking too much out of your portfolio or becoming too conservative. Uh, either one of those can cause you uh, to run out of money while you're still alive, and I can't think of m many things worse than that. <laughs> So you've been in this business for a couple of years, I suppose, right? A couple of decades. <laughs> so as I'm going through the book, and I was thinking of you, and I was saying, all right, well, Larry's been doing this for several decades. What surprised you the most of strategies that you would recommend today that you probably wouldn't have recommended maybe 20 or 30 years ago? Um, there. First of all, I think it's important to recognize that the, what we like to call the science of investing or evidence-based investing uh, continues to advance, just like it does in medicine. We learn new things. And like all smart people, when you learn something new, you don't cling to old ideas if you find that there are better alternatives. Uh, so. Uh, we have now begun to add some alternative investments to our portfolios that didn't even exist years ago until uh, what is called uh, an interval fund has been introduced by the SEC. So interval funds, which allow only partial liquidity redemptions, they are required to allow you to withdraw 5% every quarter at a minimum doesn't mean you can't get out more, but in aggregate, all investors can only get out 5% per quarter, so 20% a year. Uh, that allows mutual funds through these interval structures to invest in things that are less liquid, investments that the Yales and Harvards and other sophisticated institutional investors have been able to invest in for decades, diversifying their risks. Uh, uh, be because now they don't have to have daily liquidity. For example, you can't invest in a reinsurance contract uh, because it's one year if you need to price it daily. You can't invest in consumer loans, which are three, five, seven year loans, if you need daily liquidity. Uh, so we have now added some funds uh, to our menu of investments because we believe they provide unique sources of risk and return uh, and help reduce the downside risk of portfolios. And we cover them in, uh, in the book as well. So the science of investing does advance uh, and we try to stay with it. That's a big part of my job. Anything else looking at, I think, um, because we're living longer, uh, maybe before looking at, um, you know, I know you had a chapter on annuities. There's a chapter on reverse mortgages. Um, right. You know, there's there's different things that now might be coming into play that, you know, before it would be, you know, that, that, that those are kind of last resorts or never buy an annuity because you, you're just paying a huge commission. And, and, and both you, um, your for, firm and our firm are, are, are fee-only registered investment advisors. We don't sell any products. But kind of looking at the full scale now of just trying to put this retirement puzzle piece together, um, I, I think some unique strategies, <clears throat> excuse me, are coming out, especially, you know, in the alternative space. Yeah, I would, I, your point uh on dealing with the longevity risk is an important one. As I mentioned, I hardly knew anyone who was over 75 
Uh, I think my oldest grandparent didn't quite make it to that age. Uh, so we didn't worry about uh, having to have a large pool of money that would, say, need to last more than five or 10 years, typically. Uh, so, but today we need to plan for a retirement that could be 30 years. And that creates the risk of living longer than even we expect. And one of the ways to address that is an annuity. Now, as you touched on, both our firms strongly advise against investing in variable annuities, which typically have high cost investments inside and big commissions to the sellers. But uh, there is a place for annuities that are immediate payouts called SPIAs, or in my preference is to consider uh, what is called the longevity annuity. So it might be you retire at 65, I should be budgeting for my life expectancy, maybe say to age 80 or 85. I don't need to buy insurance against that. I want to buy insurance only for the unexpected, so I might buy a deferred annuity that starts paying out at age 85. And now, because I've got this big deductible, if you will, the amount of capital I have to put up to buy that annuity is much, much smaller. And that alleviates a big hurdle that many have in buying annuities. They don't want to give up that liquidity. So that's a really important tool. I'll touch on very briefly reverse mortgages. We have a chapter on that. Many people have a lot of their financial or net worth in their homes. Then they may, as they get older, want to be able to live with dignity and not maybe go to a long-term care facility, but they can't afford to do so because their assets are tied up in their home equity. A reverse mortgage is still a fairly expensive alternative but it still may be a good one for those who are want and have the priority of staying in their home and uh, being cared for with dignity, can draw on that asset and create the assets to pay for the long-term care they need at their home. And that's one way of doing it without having to rely on your family or having to sell that home. So that could be a really good option for many people. Awesome stuff, Larry. We're just talked on you know a couple of different topics and you know we're just we only scratched the surface so get his book your complete guide to a successful and secure retirement where can they find it larry just came out right yeah it just came out a couple of weeks ago you can uh go to amazon.com of course where you could buy everything not just books and um, one thing for your readers uh to know uh, it's always my pleasure and my co-author kevin grogan both of us always happy to answer questions from readers so you just have to email me uh and i'm sure if you really want a copy you might just ask joe and al if they'll get one for you absolutely anyone that wants a copy of larry's book you just ask alan clopine <laughs> and he will definitely get everyone a copy of this phenomenal book I I very deep pockets i i will do it right that's why we call him big al larry because he's got big big pockets can hardly keep my pants up, right? It's a, <laughs> such a big wallet. <laughs> it's a big wallet. That's why his back's all jacked up. He can't sit down. Uh, uh, well, it's as always my pleasure to be with you, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk again next month. All right. That sounds great, Larry. That's Larry Swedro, folks. Hey, it's time to start thinking about filing your 2018 taxes. Download our free tax checklist by clicking special offer at the brand new yourmoneyyourwealth.com or find the link in the show notes. If you still need help and you've got a microphone on your computer, just scroll a little further down on yourmoneyyourwealth.com, click Ask Joe and Al on air and record a question for Joe and Big Al to answer right here on the podcast. No mic? You can still submit your question on a text form as well. Speaking of taxes, here's Jack from Atlanta with a microphone and a capital gains tax question. Hello. I'm trying to figure out the best way to simplify my portfolio. For years, I've been investing monthly into a number of mutual funds and taxable accounts at four different institutions. Now I want to combine it all under one fund before I retire early next year. How can I do this and avoid a high tax bill on capital gains? This is Jack from Atlanta, by the way. Thanks. All right. Uh, Jack, thank you for doing that. See, this is a lot of fun. Alan. It is a lot of fun. What? All right. So he's trying to consolidate, it sounds like. Right. He's got uh, 
four different institutions. So that's like different custodians. So he's got an account at maybe Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, Merrill Lynch, sure, Vanguard. Vanguard, whatever. Right. And he's like, okay, well, I'm getting all these statements. I'm looking to retire. I want to simplify my life. How do I go about doing this to avoid capital gains? Right. Well, I got a first thought here. You can always consolidate your investments and not incur any type of capital gain. Right. So let's say you want to hold all of your money at, I don't know, Charles Schwab, right? We have Charles Schwab is not paying me for this. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> yes. Chuck, yeah, Chuck and I go way back. Okay. All you need to do is just do a transfer. You can transfer all these different accounts, and you can consolidate all of your investments under one roof if you yeah. choose to. So that would make it much simpler. Instead of four statements every month, you have one statement from Charles Schwab. And so, you, like you say, you don't sell the assets. You just transfer. In kind. In, in kind. Right. right. So it goes over in kind. The investment you had at Fidelity, you still have at Charles Schwab. There was no sale. There is no tax consequence. A lot of times, people think that that is diversification. Right. right, different custodians. Different custodians. I got two hundred thousand here. I got three hundred there. I got fifty thousand here. I got ten bucks over here. You know, I'm diversified. Yeah. Well, no, not. I mean, sure, but you you don't necessarily when you're looking at securities, right? You are an owner of that particular company. People, I think, might get confused with CDs. Yes, you. If if you have millions of dollars and you want to buy FDIC insured CDs, then you have to use several different institutions. Right. That is true. Not with security, <laughs> securities, yeah. because Charles Schwab is like a gro- grocery store. Charles Schwab in Fidelity, let's say, you got, um, you know, Albertsons versus Kroger. Okay. Okay. Good for P- you. Pretty good, huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I go grocery shopping <laughs> do, a lot. Do you get payouts from them, And there's actually too? Kroger in Atlanta, so there yeah. you go. <laughs> right? And then there's Vons. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I, I thought you were said Vons and Ralphs. Those are the common ones here. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Or um, Hy-Vee. Hi V. <laughs> I think that's one. Okay. <laughs> um, so you go to that grocery store. Um, you could buy beans at all of those grocery stores for the same price, roughly, right? And that's that's usually what you buy first. Say, <laughs> yes. say do, does Ra- Ralph's or Vons have better selection of beans? <laughs> right? Or bananas or yeah. whatever. You know, if you want frozen chicken, yeah. you can just go there, right? And all they, of those stores got, will have it. They got the same stuff. They got the same stuff, right? Right. So. If I want to buy Apple stock, I can buy that Apple stock through Fidelity, through TD Ameritrade, through Charles Schwab, through E-Trade, through whatever. So I can buy a can of beans at Ralph's and Vons, and that's not diversification. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So if I'm running to Ralph's and then buy one can of beans, and then I'm like, oh, I need another can, but I uh, I can't buy two cans here. Yeah, they're not allowed. (laughs) I got to go to Ralph's (laughs) or Vons, whatever. So but uh, what I'm saying is that, all right, you go to the supermarket, and then you buy all of your stuff at that one supermarket is very simple. It's very easy. Right. Well, same with your investments. You can go to one place to buy all of those different, uh, you know, like Charles Schwab doesn't necessarily have more options for you than a Fidelity. Right. Is yeah. my point. I, agreed. Agreed. Right. So the other thing that you can do, so now you'll end up with a bunch of different investments inside, to use your example, Charles Schwab. And so, and, and maybe you don't want that many investments, or maybe they're not the best investments for you going forward. Right. So now then you're looking at selling, then that's yeah. where the capital gains that's come in. That's where the capital gains come in. And, and what I like to do in a case like that is look investment by investment and look at the amount of gains in each investment relative to the investment itself. And then I come up with a gain percentage. Like if you bought Apple stock, let's just say you had the fortune to buy that 10 years ago, it might have gone up five times. Or whatever, so that's that's a that'd be a tough one to sell from a tax standpoint. It might be the right thing to sell from an asset diversification standpoint, but from a tax standpoint. So if you're just thinking taxes, that would be at the bottom of the list. On the other hand, you might have an S and P 500 fund that you bought at the beginning of last year, and it's actually down. So you could sell that one. You actually create a tax loss that would allow you to sell some other stuff. So you just kind of rank these investments and then come up with a strategy on how to gradually sort of get this reallocated without paying a ton of tax. So put it this way. Get a spreadsheet. Name your investments on the one column of your spreadsheet. Correct. Okay. And then the second column of the spreadsheet, I would put market value. Correct. So if I bought Apple, it's worth $100,000. Then the next column, what you would want to put down is cost basis, what you purchased it for. So my first is what the investment is 
Apple. Second column is going to be market value, 100000 And then my cost basis, let's say it's $50,000. Then on the third column, it's going to say gain or loss. In that particular example, I have a $50,000 gain. So you want to do that with all of your investments. Just put it together, a simple spreadsheet, put the, the name of the investment, the market value, the cost basis, and then gain or loss. And then what Al, I think, is what you're saying is just rank those to the lowest to the highest, right? So you could probably diversify. Maybe you had 50 different investments, right? But maybe you could diversify out of 30 of them, and you know, and then your full gain on all those 30 investments might be only twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, or it could, versus if you did everything, it could be 150 thousand. Right, or it could be zero right. if you have some positions that are in a loss, and you net that with other positions where you don't have a lot of gain in them, but it's a lot of proceeds. So anyway, that that's really how you look at it, and I'm proud of you. That's that's an accountant's answer. Yeah. Here, let's get a spreadsheet. Right, here's column one. Here's column two. But I think that would help someone. Yes. quite a bit just to, because that's what we do when we look at this. Is like okay, well. Well, what is the most that we can diversify out with the least amount of tax? Yeah. And then the next thing we do, once we've done that, it's like, all right, now let's look at your tax bracket. Like if you're in the <laughs> lowest tax bracket, call it the 10 or 12% bracket, your capital gains are taxed at zero. So maybe you can maybe you can accommodate another $40,000 of gains, still stay in that low bracket, and, and pay zero taxes, at least zero federal taxes. It'll, you'll still have to pay state taxes, probably. So just um, some things that you can use there to help you. Um, but another piece of advice, uh, Jack from Atlanta, is it's the beginning of the year. Um, and I would more or less worry more about the diversification. Don't let the tax dog shake the tail. Yeah, I, well, you <laughs> always ask me I always forget. But that's, that's right. <laughs> Whatever. Don't, don't let the tail wag the dog. Don't let the, is that what the it is? tax Tail, tail, wag the dog. Wag, wag the, the investment dog. There you go. <laughs> that sounds weird. That but. sounds bad. <laughs> I don't think that's right. Anyway, so it's the beginning of the year. I would look at, okay, well, now I did my spreadsheet. I see what the total gain is. I probably would want to diversify out to have the right portfolio for me. Now that it sounds like you're transitioning into an early retirement next year, you want to make sure that you have the right portfolio put in place. Then you want to tax manage the heck out of that account because stocks are volatile. And this sounds like you're in a brokerage account because you're worried about capital gains. You could tax loss harvest along the way, and then that would offset any gain. You have you know the next 12 months to tax manage the overall account um, because the, the, the your full gain or loss is not going to be fully calculated until December 31st. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Investments are more important. The right investments for you are more important than the taxes. You always consider taxes, but that's not really the first thing you look at. All right, that's it for us. We'll see you again next week. Show's called Your Money Award. Special thanks to today's guest, Larry Swedrow. Check the show notes for today's episode at the brand new yourmoneyyourwealth.com for links to Larry's latest articles on the markets and to find the link to buy Larry's latest book, Your Complete Guide to a Successful and Secure Retirement. Next week, millennial millionaire Grant Sabatier returns to the show to tell us all about his new book, Financial Freedom, A Proven Path to All the Money You Will Ever Need. Subscribe to the podcast on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, listen on YouTube, or find it on your favorite podcast podcast app. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. For your free financial assessment, just visit purefinancial.com. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. Yeah.